Welcome back to Take a Leap and Transform in your diversity journey. I'm your host, Joseph Kimuscat. Are you ready to take a leap with me? As we embark on this journey, let me introduce myself as Malta's Neo Diversity Consultant, Joseph Kimuscat. I've been pioneering Neo Diversity awareness within Malta business landscape for the past three years. During this time, I've engaged in speaking, coaching, and conducting workshops with companies and organizations like Betson, Bena, and FHRD. This year marks the introduction of Neo Diversity Week to Malta, where we present insights from incredible guests about neo divergency within the workplace. Now let's leap into our interview. HR plays a pivotal role in supporting neo divergent staff, contingent upon a clear understanding of neo divergency and knowledge of best practices. This includes implementing effective policies, procedures, universal design principles being proactive with mental health, providing training for management, and offering reasonable accommodations. All of these necessities are more people-centric approaches. To delve into this discussion, I'm joined by not just one HR professional, but two of them, Adena Maria Vela and Natalie Lewis. Adena Maria Vela, with over 13 years of dynamic human resource experience in Malta, is passionate about driving growth and engagement. Maria is an HR specialist at, you've actually changed jobs now, but you were at, 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 at <laughs> up your level in insightful coaching and training. She specializes in helping businesses establishing, enhancing their HR functions and strategies, aligning them with their vision and values. Now let's meet our award-winning HR consultant, Natalie Lewis. With a master's in HR management, founder of Dynamic HR Services Limited in 2013, leading conversations on hybrid working, leadership and culture, and tech and digital creative SMEs. Nally's envisions happy, high-performance employees in all small, medium businesses. Her founding foundation of success framework helps businesses establish great company culture and modern leadership, enabling growth without the risk of toxic, toxic culture. Known as the unconventional HR person, Natalie combines HR, compassion, and commerciality with a strong dose of common sense. Welcome, Adana and Natalie. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Hi. Jason. So <clears throat> we've had a really wonderful prep talk. You guys got to meet each other and introduce yourself for the first time, broke some ice, and now we're going to go even further and breaking that ice through our lovely conversation during this hour. And I'd like to thank both of you for really coming on board to share this dynamic experience. I brought the two of you together as I wanted to give a more international and local dynamic on human resources and its relationship to neodiversity, particularly from the UK where there have been, where they have been frankly, leading in neodiversity awareness in the workplace. And some say the UK is about 10 years ahead. In comparison, neodiversity in Malta is still in their early stages, where I have been pioneering this for the last three years. So I wanna start with you, Natalie. What are some of the lessons you can share with us that HR professionals are taught taking more productive in supporting neodivergent employees? Okay, hi, Joseph, um, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, so I think, to be honest, I didn't actually realize that UK was that far ahead because it doesn't feel like it, <laughs> okay? Um, because I, I am constantly having conversations with leaders of small businesses, particularly, um, and, and bigger businesses around, you know, neurodiversity and um, the awareness of it. I think you're right in terms that we are probably ahead of some other countries in terms of uh, legislation, but whether that actually relates into um, in practice, I would say is, is diff you know, is, is probably not quite, um, quite there yet. Certainly not from my point of view, because I am neurodiverse myself. I have ADHD, dyslexia, show some autistic traits. Um, so to answer your question, I think, um, and bear in mind that I don't know anything about other countries' legislation, so I'm just going to talk about the UK legislation, but I think our Equality Act, which was brought out in 2012, so Equality Act 2010, 
um, is a really robust framework that has definitely helped with um, encouraging your more sort of um, diversity and and um, uh, I suppose really sort of um, encourages uh, employers to deal with you know disabilities more sort of openly. Um, the legislation has definitely been um, the driving force, I reckon, behind much of this sort of efforts in the UK to be more um, diverse and more inclusive um, for neurodiverse um, employees. So that's definitely that's one thing that I would certainly say is, has been really used uh, or sort of really um, something that's pushed, you know, the, the sort of neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, in terms of the other things that are available, um, I don't know whether other countries have this, but we have something called Access to Work, which is a government led initiative, which is aimed at increasing um, employment opportunities for neurodiverse um, individuals, both in setting up their own business, but also as employees as well. And I think that's certainly a really good programme that has definitely helped um, provide financial support to um, workplaces to be able to make adjustments and offer additional support to disabled um, employees, you know, whether then you're any disabled um, uh, employee, including neurodiverse people. Um, but I think that's been an interesting, you know, that's certainly interesting. And I actually don't think a lot of employers know much about that, but it's something I constantly bring up with my clients um, where we have neurodiverse or and disabled employees. Um, I think we've also seen a number of recruit specialist recruitment agencies that are coming out um, that you know that really um, focus on placing neurodiverse um, employees into organisations, um, and that often means sort of tailoring recruitment processes and onboarding processes to make sure that they are neurodiverse friendly. Um, they often also offer sort of HR support um, or supports for HR people and you know leaders as well. So I think that's sort of really something that's been embraced over the years. Um, and again, you know, again, if we go back to the Equality Act, there's definitely much more of an awareness about making reasonable adaptations or reasonable um, uh, adjustments that for for those people with neurodiversities. Um, and I think also the other thing that I've noticed recently is certainly um, innovative workplaces. So adapting the workplace to be more neurodiverse friendly. So things with lighting, quiet spaces, um, a better, you know, sort of the quiet zones and better sort of um, placed, you know, sort of places for people to get away to. You know, these little pods that you can hide away into and, and that kind of thing um, to be able to accommodate those people with maybe, you know, sensory needs. Um, and then I guess really it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, I suppose it's on people like myself really to, um, to train and to, um, to imp in, improve knowledge and understanding and learning around these things. So, yeah, I mean, that's certainly all of the things that I, I know I'm aware of, um, but it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm interested to hear really um, about what, what is happening in Malta and other countries that you may know of. Well, yeah, I mean, just to go a little bit reverse, I mean, on um, Monday, we had the pleasure of interviewing Mark Crowley from Diversita from the UK, mm -hmm. who's set up a, a recruitment agency specially designed for recruiting neo-divergent talent. And so he gave some really some insightful information in regards to um, the access to work. Malta doesn't quite have something similar there is a scheme that companies can apply for yes. through uh, multi-enterprise to get funding to put towards uh, making changes within their companies for, for more easy access for physically handicapped um, or people with disabilities, should I say, is the proper terminology. And with... Um, with um, There's Jobs Plus too. And Jobs There's Plus jobs as well. Plus too. Um, uh, which which helps because obviously it's it's a grant because the it 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 allows the companies to I believe it's it's um, a tax um, uh, grant or something like that very similar but it's not specifically to neurodiversity neurodiverse uh, employees right it's not as robust so 
yeah, it's not as robust as the access to work. And yeah, you're granted mm. a, a lot of people from the UK do not know about or businesses do not know about the uh, access to work. I've done a number of trainings of managers in the UK and I bring up access to work and they all kind of look at me and said, I never knew this existed. Yeah. So same it's a, here. Same here. Yeah. You know, and so to be fair, I never knew it existed until I was diagnosed and then started looking into it and somebody told me. So it seems to be very much off if you're in the environment and you're sort of you know talking to other that neurodiverse or other disabled people that they might know about it and they might talk about it but um it's not widely known about yeah but, but the government yeah. probably isn't advertising it either because you know <laughs> i'm not sure they want to be spending loads of money <laughs> right right i mean and, and to go to your 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 point about the where uk stands i mean Definitely in the early 90s and 80s, the North America, particularly the United States, was very far ahead with the research, particularly in regards to research towards children. And then you have Jobs, which is the American uh, Government Association for, for, for providing accessibility and information and about that accessibility. But then we've seen a leap, particularly from what I've seen in the last five years, a leap towards since COVID, where there's been the move towards the UK, where there's been a lot of organizations a lot of research and you even have people from north america saying that yeah in regards to the workplace focus for neurodivergence the uk has taken that leap and has become a lot more further ahead in, in regards to other regions because of that now that could be debatable uh definitely here in malta it's still very new so with that said i want to come to you adana from the time working, from your time working with up your level, and our collaboration together on one of those aspects, you and I talked about was businesses being value oriented, particularly when it comes to supporting their employees. What can you share with us about how Maltese businesses are embracing this, and what lessons can be shared in supporting neurodivergent employees? So, um, apart from uh, from uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me over to, to this um, discussion. And uh, before I, I I joined up, um, I worked in a local Maltese business, um, family-run business, and uh, and obviously it for for me there it was a very a new topic of obviously um, neurodiversity. Then um, I joined up. As, a, as an HR specialist and I met you and we started discussing it and, and obviously I knew that that it, it was it was in there it was it was lacking um, there was no information about it um, but throughout the the, the 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 years I worked at up and uh, got to visit different companies it made me realize that at least the seed is there and and it's growing slowly slowly um obviously there's the advantage of having um larger companies in malta that are global companies so they introduce the the neurodiversity the inclusion policy and uh, and obviously other local companies will start um looking at what the bigger companies are doing and they 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 basically follow follow the the i gaming industry which is quite a huge industry in malta and obviously they are the leaders um now that uh, that i've moved moved uh, um from up i'm currently working with a maltese company as well it's a family family business which is um quite a, a large company uh, however it is it is new um uh, the neurodiversity concept the the inclusion concept it's new so uh, it is it is a process i i will be um looking at and obviously introducing it um slowly slowly so yes there are companies who are um following the the i gaming the the global the global companies but when it comes to multis owned we are still lacking behind, and uh, even when it comes to the well-being of of neurodiverse uh, employees, we're we we'll still we still we still need to look at other countries and learn, and and look at the bigger picture because obviously we're we're uh, slightly behind. 
Diana, can I ask what sort of laws yes. you've got in place? Like, what what are the Maltese laws? Are they similar to our laws or so? Not? The laws, uh, Joseph, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong. Um, when it comes to laws, they they mostly um, are targeted to disability. Right. So there, as far as I know, there's no uh, law that covers neurodiversity here in Malta. We might have, or uh, if it's a um, uh, a European uh, level of legislation, then we might we might get it. But um, so far, as far as 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 I'm aware, it's it's just disability that we cover. You're, you're, you're... That's the same for us. Yeah. The Equality Act covers disabilities, but it's very clear that neurodiversities. Um, will fo generally fall under that definition. Right, that's just what I'm about in to fact, say. Joseph and myself, um, we were working in a in a focus group, and we will be will be launching a, a business case too. And we had the same argument, and we were <laughs> discussing this. This obviously neurodiversity is not included in 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 the law. It's it's just covering uh, disability right i mean you're, you're you're right in what you're saying it's it's, it's you have to read between the lines what the, what malta has done natalie is that they've basically followed the template from the eu and okay. basically what the eu has stated for disability for neodiversity for even accommodations malta has basically followed that template so it is there in the legislation but with neodiversity it is about reading between the lines and even when we talk about accommodations which is very important there is this this disbelief that that you have to have um, an official diagnosis to get accommodations both the eu law and maltese law which again is very similar following that template has both stated that you do not have to have an official diagnosis to get accommodations and they both recognize that accommodations not providing accommodations is seen as discriminatory. Yes. You know, yes, 100%. And what we do have a particular problem with, particularly when we take a look at physical disabilities, is we have that 2% that rule where they need to, companies who have over 20 employees need to employ up to about 2% of those individuals, people with disabilities. And if they don't, they get a fine. The challenge that we're having is that many opt to pay the fine than to become inclusive. Ooh, that's naughty. Yeah, that's Ooh, very that's naughty. <laughs> well, the fine is very low. That's why it's, it's, it's very low. We need to raise that fine, and that's the particular challenge that we're having. And again, it's still a learning curve. When we take a look at, we have organizations and stakeholders. We even have stakeholders and what Adena has mentioned in regards to the business case that we're putting together who are part of government entities who are putting in this business putting in the value of the business case but at the same time there are as much as there are stakeholders they're still facing the challenge in getting businesses to recognize the law to accept what the law is and to also put in best practices for inclusion and we have that problem with physical disabilities imagine the problem that we're having for invisible disabilities Sure. Yeah, interesting. I think we've we're lucky that um, in the UK we've had a lot of celebrities come out and talk about neurodiversities, particularly ADHD. Um, and I think that's become because it's aware aware there's more awareness in the public. Um, and again, any TikTok, if you if you you know tune into TikTok and Instagram, there's a lot of people talking about ADHD in particular. Um, that seems to be the sort of more um, commonly spoken about. Um, certainly in my in my algorithms, it is anyway. Um, but I think that's really helped um, sort of push the awareness into society, and therefore because there's a more of a societal um, awareness. And you know, certainly with my um, small, with a lot of the small businesses that I'm, I'm just they're generally director um, found or founder director led. Um, so, you know, they also often identify that they themselves have neurodiversities. Uh, I would say that I would say probably 80 percent of the people um, that I work with and um, the business owners have some sort of neurodiversity, whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, and I think that's certainly driven awareness a lot better. So therefore, employees are more aware and they may be out seeking diagnoses as well. Um, but they also know the law and know that they can ask for reasonable adjustments, accommodations, as you were saying, 
um, and therefore they do ask. So we, I think there's, it, it's more of a societal thing right now hmm. as well. Yes, definitely, even in Malta, it's, it's. Um, I think we don't have um, as much awareness as as we should have. Like the awareness is we get it from from school. You just get a. Uh, ADHD Awareness Day, but I don't think that we're doing um, uh, the most we can to to explain and and obviously um, understand what is this ADHD or this um, autism, because sometimes we tend to put people in boxes and we can understand only that person if he labels himself as being an ADHD instead of reversing it and uh, playing with the strengths of that person. Because for me, for me as an HR person, I don't really need to know whether you're ADHD, whether you're autistic or whether you have uh, whatever neurodiversity, but I need to, to, to play with your strengths. So if you're good at, at um, processing things or if you're very good at putting things in order, then I will use that strength. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, I, I want to ask Dana uh, before before I ask. I, I want to bring up a couple points here. Um, it's very interesting. You know, yes, we need to be strength focused. But what's also interesting, you know, you mentioned that ADHD. Right now, ADHD is speaking the loudest. Back in the early in the early eighties and nineties, it was autism, dyslexia, and then ADHD was slowly coming up. So it comes down to who's who's the loudest voice at the current moment. And I'm currently reading a. a a book for neodiversity and coaching. And one of the points that come out uh, uh, with it very early within the first few pages is, it's interesting in the fact that when we take a look at workplace um, advocacy, we have autism at work programs, but we don't have ADHD access to work programs. We don't have dyslexia access to work programs or dyscalculia or development coordination disorder or so forth. So I mean, there was a lot of screaming voices for autism, but now we need to do the same thing for the other ones to have those access to work programs. So, it's true. With that said, and I want to say yeah, something. Please go ahead. Um, uh, I saw. I saw. Um, obviously, since I look a lot and I read a lot about ADHD, um, I tend to get everything on ADHD. So I get shorts. I get get. New speeds. Those <laughs> algorithms. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I keep getting this this quote, which I really love. It's uh, an AD, ADHD person has a Ferrari brain uh, in a in a motorcycle. I think. Or no, no. Uh, it's, I know. The, the I know. I know which quote. It's from. It's from Doctor 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 Edward uh, no, Noel, I believe. Um, and he and, and it's from his book. Uh, ADHD has Ferrari brains, but bicycle brakes. Bicycle, yes, but and and it's it's literally like that. So yeah. it's when when I when I read it and I understood it because yes, it is a Ferrari. It's it's a Ferrari brain because it's always revved up and w wanting to run. We're not using that. We're not using that. We're not. We're not using that Ferrari. We're just killing it because we're not letting that Ferrari drive as much as they can because we want to put them set up in our neurotypical world. Right, and we're also and, and it's 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 a pity. It is, and like and that. the education system, and even as adults who have late diagnosis, there isn't anything to support them in training them and how to develop to make those bicycle brakes much stronger. I mean, it will never become Ferrari brakes, but at least try to give them the skills to make those brakes much stronger. And then we have to take a look at the workplace and how the workplace can support that and helping well, them make it stronger. Now, um, Natalie had mentioned in regards to she works with a lot of owners who happen to be neodivergent. When you were working with Uplevel and in, in now in your, your new position, have you noticed that particular <laughs> Actually, I was always looking at people and I, I always question like every time I meet um, directors or very high uh, or executive level, it, it seems that you I actually you have um, neurodiverse 
people because it's it you can I, I can feel it I, I I I know when I'm speaking to someone obviously as I said before we started I can start ticking and I say okay so most probably um, his ADHD or or he has some but yes I I I did feel it but I I wasn't um, sure about it so actually Natalie just uh, if, if, if obviously you have the the data that shows that then uh, my gut feeling was right <laughs> so with that said i mean i mean you mentioned earlier eye gaming is ahead and i happen to agree we we you and i with the focus group originally started from betson and betson has really been leading the way if we talk in regards to um trying to educate the eye gaming to be more inclusive to a bunch of people but in particular for this topic neodiversity um and now I'm, I'm sure everybody is waiting for us to get to best practices so let's get right into best practices because we've, we've we've we we set up the 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 foundation for it so my next list of questions for both of you what does hr need to understand about neodiversity employees within the workplace so shall I go first? Go, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think first of all um, we have to recognize that that neurodiverse employees require different strategies. So uh, even when when we're communicating, it's not just sending out an email that you as the sender understand. So you have to give it some time, read it, and make sure it is it is. Um, understandable by 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 um, by everyone um it me if it's for example i don't know um task management task management some some neurodiversity neurodiverse employee will struggle with that or time management so it's it's up to us as hr to identify these these little um small things that we can help out and make um, life a little bit easier at the workplace um, and obviously which is it it's not because of neurodiversity it's for all employees i believe that every time we communicate we give clear guidelines so it's it's the message is clear because it's useless writing a huge email that I understand, and then I have twenty percent of my 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 workforce got nothing from it, or didn't understand. And sometimes we have to understand that people are afraid to to ask, and and uh, to to ask what was what was meant with that email, and maybe explain. So I think th for me that is crucial in the way we we communicate, and obviously training and 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 informing the the staff and making them aware that that uh, these people are sitting next to them and it could be them obviously and you know <laughs> nelly yeah i think that's i mean absolutely 100 percent endorse that and i think um i'm certainly encouraging my clients to use a lot of different platforms as well for communication so um, where we send out a company-wide email, we might also summarize it in a WhatsApp uh, video as well, um, so that people have got two different mediums to, to read or to, to listen to or watch. Um, for me, I think it's about strengths-based approach. So having, looking at an individual, looking at what their strengths are and, um, where possible kind of creating a role around that or certainly making sure in fact Adana you, you mentioned it earlier um you know is, is sort of saying to people who are perhaps you know really data driven or very um you know got really good attention to detail which isn't me by the way um and you would give them those types of projects whereas for somebody like myself you'd probably give me something more like business development or something where i can just go and chat and speak to people and do things you know <laughs> around, rather than sitting down writing reports with lots of detail and I think that's really important is to to um yeah adapt um to somebody's um you know superpowers basically I know I have a lot of superpowers um and I also know what I'm very not good at and do not ever give me anything to do with maths calculations or data right but um I think if you can if you can um 
trigger people and uh, trigger people's um, superpowers, um, enhance people's superpowers and give them the environment and the time to be able to do that you know so for example you know you might want to take a an adhd person and allow them to have a lot of quiet time to just really deep focus and get into a hyper focus to be able to do reports or whatever it is then then that would be um useful and i think that sort of then sits with helping employees to um by having lots of different uh, environments that they can go into whether it means working from home occasionally you know for some some people whether it's having quiet areas or sort of you know quieter with with less lighting and things like that you know it's about sort of adapting your environment and not just expecting everyone to be able to perform and do well in like an open office environment because i know from my point of view like i was terrible in an open office environment um, I'd be listening into everyone else's conversations and not doing any of my work, right? So <laughs> it's things like that, I think, um, would certainly, you know, would certainly help more. Um, in fact, yes. Um, uh, on on that point of, of working in an open office, I, I always worked in an open office, except when I was working remotely from home. Mm. Um, although I, I'm okay with working in an open office, an office i would like to have my own corner so uh, if i need i just go in there and when i need to focus i just put on the headphones <laughs> listen to the music which i like obviously most probably it, it will be always the three same songs um on repeat and definitely and adhd <laughs> <laughs> that's a de adhd trait but go on <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, because it's it's, I have my 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 track. I have my playlist for doing the payroll. So during my my payroll time, I have a playlist. <laughs> Keep me saying, yeah. Oh, I get it. <laughs> so I can focus on those numbers, which I hate. Yes. <laughs> so you know, you, let's go back for a moment for the well-being aspect because we talked about training. And, and you both focus on the well, the well-being aspect. And then we also talked about in regards strength being focus. So what can we do to encourage Maltese businesses to one focus on better well-being of their employees? Uh, and two, what strategies can we get them to focus on strength base? Because for example, Natalie, you mentioned that, that um, you're horrible at details. But in the workplace, you're expected to, to follow more on the details, but you're more of a big picture thinker, right? So, so how can you know, a manager say, okay, Natalie's not good at the details, but she's really good at connecting the dots? Yeah, sorry, I had to mute myself because my dog was barking at something. Um, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I think, um, hmm. Let me let, just just ask me that question again. Sorry, I was. So so we have getting companies to be focused more yeah. on employee well beings. Yeah. And the second question is focusing and highlighting on the strengths and utilizing those strengths, noticing those strengths. Okay. okay. So I think on the well being side of things, um, neurodiverse people um, are very resilient, but there's a come to a point where generally they're not aware of um, the fact that they burn out pretty quickly. Okay. And a lot of undiagnosed people will probably be going through that pattern of um, really working really hard, burning out, and then wondering what's going on for them. So bringing an awareness to employees that that is a thing, because I didn't, I was doing it for many years, didn't realize why, what, what was happening. Same. Um, yeah. So I think having that awareness and allowing people to, and also to be fair, managers asking people, you know, are you okay? And do you need time off and allowing people to book holiday when they know that they need time off rather than you know i think a lot of people sort of book holidays you know every quarter or you know they save them up for christmas or whatever but i think we need to and this applies to anybody by the way it's not just neurodiverse people but i think we should be encouraging people to split time you know so that holidays up over the years over the year so that they're not just sort of banking them for summer or christmas um so that they're getting proper rest breaks but also perhaps allowing neurodiverse people to be able to say, do you know what, today, I literally cannot come in today, I'm going to take a welfare day, um, or I really need to just work from home today. I think that flexibility and flexible working is really, really important. Um, 
And again, to be honest, anything that you put in for neurodiverse people is also really input, you know, really good practice for um, neurotypicals. So, you know, you're doing yourself all of your staff a service if you use some of these use some of these practices in your business. In terms of being able to um, focus on people's strengths, obviously it's useful to for, for the person, you know, the employee to understand their own strengths. So sometimes, you know, I'd say coaching, um, having some coaching available available to people would be useful. Um, I suppose really, you know, I'm not saying that we should be writing jobs for people, like you know, but I think it's about sort of saying to people, you know, if if, if as you said, um, for, for me, I'm better at, you know, doing sort of more of the people side of things. I'm not brilliant at t- attention to detail. Maybe it's about having multiple people within your business. And, it, and this is like, this is this is 101 stuff of having really good teams is having other people in the business. So you have your, you know, friendly, happy sort of people who um, are perhaps are not detail driven, but very good at rallying people together and leading people. With then um you know those people who are more um detail driven who can make up for that and who you know i could send a report to you know somebody else and say listen you're this is your bag can you read through this and just put in the extra details for me it's about having a really good team cohesion and i do a lot of psychometric testing with businesses and making sure that they have teams that do um complement each other but also from going back to access to work, for example, I have a VA um, who, or a PA that works with me who manages my diary and helps me with some of the things that I can't do for my business. Or it's not that I can't do it. It takes a lot of energy to do it, right? And it ends up one of those tasks that I end up procrastinating a, a, you know, a lot over. So in order to help me with that, I have someone like that. But access to work, even for employees, could provide that type of support for an employee as well as you know self-employed or you know directors of businesses so i think it's important to utilize those things make sure that you've got people who are you know diverse across their abilities so where you've got you know people who are who are very uh, outgoing and you know good at what they do is to have those people who are more detail driven who can second eyes over a you know, a report and go, oh, yeah, here are a load of typos, love. <laughs> go and change them. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's that's what I would say. But to be fair, every single business should be doing this, whether they've got neurodiverse people in their business or not, because it makes for a better, happier workforce, more inclusive, better culture, more, you know, sort of nurturing um, approach. Adena? Um, what I would like to, to add, because obviously I completely agree with, with what Natalie just said. What um, I think we should all, always be open for feedback. So although we do policies, although we do procedures, although we try and help, I think sometimes as HR people, we need to stop and look, if, look at what we did and whether we can improve it. And, and obviously be ready for, for feedback from, from the employees employees and uh, and obviously try and um, and build a culture within the company that that is all for continuous learning because obviously the more the more you learn the feed the, the, you learn from your f- the feedback you get so apart from that apart from trying our best to accommodate and having the the best workplace possible I think we we need to focus as well on receiving feedback and accepting it and moving forward yeah and, and to that with that said you know just to go back to the the aspect of of uh, the well-being if the flexibility isn't there particularly when we look at for everyone when we when we look at for neodivergence we know that the overall costs coming from the studies done here in malta that when we look at absenteeism we're looking at about 19 to 24 million Right. So if they're not if they're not providing the flexibility, if they're not providing you know, if the manager is not flexible or the company's not flexible to give employee A uh, the time off, then that employee is going to turn around and say, OK, then I'm going to take a sick day or, yeah. you know, that yes. which is costing co- the company money or they're gonna be like, OK, I can't have a holiday, so I'm going to come to work, but I'm not going to be at 100 percent. I'm going to be at 20 yeah. percent. You know, so. yeah, yes, and and obviously sometimes it happens. It happens. Like for example, you can see sick patterns. 
like um on a monday you the the the, the sick is out of this world so uh, um uh, and and you have patterns even with with workload so as you mentioned natalie if if you're you're working and after a month you most probably need need some days off or some hours even if it's leaving early on a friday afternoon um if you don't at, at one point whether it's after a month whether it's after six months whether after a, a year whether uh, it's 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 going to get to you mm-hmm. so it's it's the leave is there and and the days off are there for a reason because obviously humans are not machines we can't just switch on and then we keep 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 working until the battery dies out because obviously it's it, it doesn't work like that we have to refuel ourselves we have to recharge ourselves and and i think it's it's um, it's different for every individual mm-hmm. like for example i know that um, after certain weeks working long hours i i need those two days where i have to switch off mm-hmm. um uh, it could be physical exercise which it's it's as companies we do even if you look at benefits locally we do give um physical uh, allowances benefits and and gym membership and whatever but but obviously um i don't know if if they work or not because obviously it's it's if you give a gym membership sometimes they they just don't go but if you just go on on the employees and say listen you can take a day off because you had that project and now it's closed it's completely different hmm. yeah and yeah. and, and at, the impact is different yeah. and and to that said you know sorry natalie you know if you're offering a gym membership let's say are you allowing the employees time during their work time to go to the gym, go to the gym. right because that's the whole point of it. You want them to re-energize, you know, get refocused. Because we do know for neodivergence, exercise is a, 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 a huge accommodation for them, particularly when they need to get physical and moving about. But if you're not allowing them to do it during the working time, knowing they're going to come back, recharge, re-energize, then it's, it's, it's a waste of money and time for mm-hmm. both employee and the company. Natalie, you were about to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think no, I think I was just I was I, I could, to be fair, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. Um, but yeah, no, I fully agree. At the end of the day, um, you know, yeah, again, benefits and things. Certainly, I'll be honest. Like a lot of my small businesses that I work with don't really offer things like, um, you know, sort of uh, gym gym uh, gym membership and things like that these days. And um, they used to, and not so much these days because they just didn't get used. But the reason why they didn't get used is because they didn't allow people time off in the daytime to go and get and use it. Um, but I certainly think there's health benefits, um, empl- employee assistance, um, helplines and things like that that I find um, a lot of businesses use and um, they provide, sorry, and then employees use. And again, I think, you know, I think I, I'm always saying to employers that if you make your workplace more friendly to neurodiverse people, everyone benefits because even neurotypical people will you know benefit from all of the different you know things that you can provide them whether it's whether it's flexibility whether it's you know t- um, different environments um you know time or the ability to work from home from time to time or you know more than that uh, more than time time to time um but i think it's very much some, about focusing on the individual as you said adana because you know everybody's different um every neurodiverse person is different different. um we you know i know what i need um but i have friends of mine who are adhd and they they need different stuff to me um but it's it's about helping your employee as an individual to figure out what's right for them so that you can help them um because you know a blanket sort of a blanket neurodiverse you know policy it's not going to work for everybody right um, and bearing in mind that, you know, ADHD is very different to autism, which is very so, also yeah, different to, you. you know, dyslexia. We can't really just blank it all. I think we just have to go, right, you as an individual, you have these issues, you have these, you know, positives, you have these issues. 
how do we help you as a person be the best that you can in our environment? And if we apply that to everybody, kind of irrelevant whether you've got neurodiversities or, exactly. yeah. or what, you know, the fact is that you're a person and we're helping you as a person, as a human being, be the best that you can. Right. And, and you know, th there's a there's a often saying there that once you've met one person who's autism, you've just met one person who's autism. You know, that person's completely different than the next person you're going to meet who has autism. Now, with all of this said, <clears throat> you know, I, I want to be respectful with the time here um, and get to some additional questions to best practices. And even and we already are providing those best practices. One of the common things during Neodiversity Week Malta has been getting leadership buy in. How can HR leaders get that leadership buy-in from board level? And, and let me add some stats here, because last week, Sydney and Giles has released their second annual index, global index report on neodiversity. And what they have found was that 43% of organizations have neodiverse champions, 21% uh, had peer mentoring programs, while 50% did not. And 21% of organizations do not have any process to aid promotions of neodiverse employees. And we know statistically that neodivergent employees have difficulty with career progression. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, if, you sp if I speak for myself, I know from a career progress point of view, I stagnated and then had nowhere else to go but to run my own business. Right. So so that was kind of, yeah, I, I, can, I can recognize that. I think um, from my perspective, getting buy in. I think it's about sort of case studies. It's about storytelling. It's about sort of um, getting those people who, you know, business owners on, you know, people who are on the board, stakeholders to resonate with some of the things that you're saying. But I think ultimately I always just sell it in that, you you know, what you want to create in a business to make it really productive and to make it, you know, um, attractive for all people um, is, is a really good culture. And that really good culture at the end of the day um, is what sets your you know, competitive advantage. So it gives you an, a, a competitive advantage above your um, above the other people in your industry, other businesses in your industry. And you know, to have a diverse talent uh, pool and to have people who are innovative and creative in your business. And for those who, you know, people who are, you know, sort of um, can think outside of the box, why wouldn't you have those people in your business? Why wouldn't you nurture them? And why wouldn't you nurture everybody in your business on an individual basis anyway? Um, is certainly the way I would look at. I think from, I have worked with a number of businesses with fairly, non-diverse boards shall we say <laughs> you know that sort of white male uh, board um which you know that the, there's a def there's definitely a huge change uh, change happening and you know boards are becoming more aware that they need to be more diverse but certainly i look at those people on the board and and sort of see find their tra you know i can see traits in them and i'm like ah oh, you you may be like you are diverse why would you not want more people like you on it um, or more people like you in the business, and, and that's kind of how I, I go about it. Adena. So I I um uh, basically I would introduce them to to actually get aware of uh, of any training or um, consultancy like partnerships with 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 other companies, and and obviously since it's board they want data so yeah. the more data i have in hand the better um it's the first it's the first time we have um that be brave um result mm. from from the uh, so study um so it's quite limited when it comes to 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 malta mm. so the data we have it's it's more uh, global data mm. rather than the local one right so, but but obviously it's it's very similar mm. um, so I think when when I was thinking about this this question it, the the data was there the top top priority because because obviously I know that these people always look at numbers so what is it going to to what are, what are we going to get back 
Um, and obviously, then it, it everything comes comes boils down to the same thing that that obviously having the the right um, culture uh, within the within the company, you have more employee engagement, um, more people working. Um, their more towards their strength so th this is all um a company culture thing but obviously yes it starts off for me it starts from from uh, presenting data hmm. well just to give a, a little bit of information natalie the be brave is an ngo organization here uh that focuses on anti-bullying and last year uh i had the privilege of being one of their community members and where we, the focus they did a study on was in bullying in the workplace and the numbers were, were quite staggering and profound for Maltese businesses about the state of workplace bullying. And one of the numbers that really stood out for me was the fact that 69% of those who said that they were bullied were bullied because of, of work-related reasons. And of course, that obviously throws alarm bells for me. It's saying, okay, what percentage of that 69% is neodivergent? Yes. You know, is it, you know, we know automatically there's an automatic 20% based on the global standard of what, who's percentage of neurodivergent. But then, of course, what percentage is undiagnosed, right? Is it under 10%? Is it under 20%? So, we, 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 this is one of the few studies that we have. There are other studies out there, most likely not so much well known in Malta. But yes, we tend to be more focused on our international study. And that's where, Adana, you and I, are working uh, with our other uh, stakeholders in regards to creating that business case to provide those actual figures and numbers. And I think a good business case for human resources is what's needed to present the buy-in, to give that data to, to board level stakeholders. So when we, that brings a nice segue to, to the next question. According to Forbes, 98% of middle to line managers desire additional training, particularly in areas such as conflict resolutions, professional development, and people skills. And we can see that there's a huge link in that towards neodiversity because we can see the conflict, res conflict with neodivergence or people development. And another study from Leadership and Management in the UK reveals that over 50% of managers express a willingness to hire neodivergent individuals due to their but due to a lack of knowledge and skills gap, what are the best practices for in HR to tackle this overreaching challenge? Mm, that's interesting. I would also say that probably what's also putting people, uh, managers off, um, either recruiting or dealing with uh, neurodiverse people is actually the fear of repercussions from the law mm. um, and you know tribunal and tribunal claims and things like that. Um, certainly, that seems to be um, a common, you know, conversation that I have with people is they don't know what to say for fear of, you know, upsetting um, people um, and causing, you know, issues with claims of, you know, bullying, harassment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think there's there's got to be training around that, and actually, I think we've got to stop fear mongering. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I'll be honest, I think HR is probably not a great um, uh, advocacy of that. I think they do use a lot of fear to try and um, mold and managers uh, into doing the right thing. But I don't actually think that is the correct way of doing things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, raising awareness, lots of training. Um, again, com as you were saying, conflict, conflict resolution um training i think it's about awareness it's about building a good culture where these things aren't a problem um Adana, probably have more well, if, if, definitely if, for, for me it was training because a lot of managers are not aware and, and obviously as you mentioned they're scared to 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 employ um neurodivergent uh, people but but uh, it comes from from training it comes from from awareness, because the more you know about it, um, uh, the more you you know how to go about it actually, and how to how to deal with 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 people. But but obviously, um, unfortunately, a lot of managers are not are not um, trained trained enough. So for me, top priority is training and and awareness. And um, basically, I think with with constant training and continuous learning and awareness, I think the wheel will will actually start moving. Well, it's really interesting because it's 
uh, Natalie, you brought up something very interesting, um, which is the the tribunal cases. We've known, oh, yes. you know, in the last few years, particularly since COVID, uh, a lot of tribunal cases have increased, particularly when it relates to neodiversity in the UK. And coming from the stats from CRPD, which is, um, I forget the acronym for CRPD. It basically, it's Malta's um, uh, or government organization for for disabil for people with disability yeah. rights. And uh, the, when I've consulted with them, they have ha have shared their knowledge that their numbers have equally gone up in tribunal cases. So we're seeing, we're definitely seeing a huge rise in this re situation where where one neodivergents are becoming more aware and becoming more vocal and becoming more aware of their rights. And as a result, we're seeing this conflict within businesses because there's this lack of training, lack of awareness and lack of support. And you also said something very interesting that, that I think really is a, a hot button topic. Uh, and I'd like to get to your, your insight in this, Adana, that HRs are fear mongering. That's a very hot topic statement. What, it's what, true. What, <laughs> then it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what's your take on this? Because I'm um, uh, I'm not like that. So um, I'm all for, for having diversity in a team because obviously you need it. You need it. It's it's if you need as you mentioned, if you need to be creative, innovative, um, you need these people. And then if you need someone whose data driven and he's very pretty much in into uh, detail and meticulous then there's someone else but but for me it's very hard to to say it and 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 it, it never crossed my mind actually that hr people are, are actually for mongering the the managers not to hire. well have <laughs> you ex have you experienced but have you experienced this with 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 fellow colleagues and other organizations no, no i've never met an hr person that was against um having neurodiversity neurodiverse employee so no, far I don't, I don't, so I don't far think it's, i don't think it's more uh, people hr against having neurodiverse there's certainly not that i think because they would you know include the cult you know they would be um naturally uh, inclusive and diverse about sort of creating diversity i think what it is is that hr people and i can say i've seen a number of hr consultants and hr oh. agencies who fear monger and say oh you know you must you must do this and you mustn't do that and you can't say this and you can't say that and it then puts managers on edge and they think oh god i don't know how to handle oh, it yes, yes. i've been told you know i shouldn't say this and i shouldn't say that and they don't yes, actually yes. then know how to deal with things so it's not about discouraging um diversities because i don't think any hr person would do that it's more about um rather than fear mongering and sort of telling um you know managers don't do this and don't say that is to say to them you know this is a better way of navigating um or you know and encouraging them to to think outside that sort of away from the fear i think sometimes exactly when we when we work from a place of fear then by mistake we trip ourselves up whereas if actually we just sort of say what we need to say yeah it kind of works better. yes 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 that, that's yeah. true and it's 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 always like that when you say some when you tell someone do not do that it immediately you 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 just block them so uh so yes it's it's changing the way we say things rather than yes. Not you need say to empower that. people rather right. than tell them no. <laughs> well, I think I think part of the I think one of the things that I've learned um, over the years, and particularly when I'm doing this neodiversity consultancy, is the fact that we need to learn how to communicate more effectively, and we haven't really been trained on how to communicate in a very professional, polite, professional manner that will get things done. It's more more retroactive. It's more emotional. Um, there's there's no there's no training in, in in regards to how to communicate as a leader. There's no training in how to how to communicate through defense communication. So there's this huge 
there's huge lack of skills in, in how we communicate. And, and, and I think I think that's where the kind of fear mongering comes to being, being is like, mm-hmm. you can't say that, but this is how you should approach it. Yeah. Here's a more open-ended question of, of, or more open-ended scaffolding. And with that said, you know, let's get to the last two questions because I want to be respectful of the, your time and, and the listeners' times. Um, what strategies do you, you kind of kind of hinted along the way, but let's try to get a little bit more direct. What strategies can can be employed to promote more people centric approaches in HR practices, especially when we're concerning neodivergent individuals? I mean, you've mentioned one to one coaching and mentoring, mm-hmm. flexibility. What other practices can we take into account? I think I think um, I would go with obviously the which I mentioned already the communication. So we have to make sure that the way we communicate is inclusive. And I like your idea, um, Natalie, that you actually have the WhatsApp as well video. That uh, that is it's it's obviously it's a very good idea. And uh, and I think it's creating a supportive and environment that they the they actually know and they feel safe that there's that psychological safety that they can open up that they're not going to be judged i think those two are are very crucial how for me. how, how if, if, if sorry nelly uh, but maybe you can jump in and, and and fill in the gap when you say creating psychological safe environments it's a very vague statement how how, how would you like three or four points clearly define that what does that look like i for me for me it means that one you feel safe that i can i i i can open up i can discuss things without being judged um that i feel valued even though i'm 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 neurodiverse and obviously i feel included so i feel that that belonging that sense of belonging within a team not just looking at me and say mm, ADHD and you push it aside. Hmm. So for me, it's that is that is psychological safety. Natalie. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the sort of things that I work with my clients is looking at uh, recruitment practices, making sure that recruitment practices and onboarding processes are you know adapted for um, you know all 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 employees, but particularly those with, who are neurodiverse. Um, certainly, you know, customized sort of onboarding processes. Certainly, I think are really useful with lots of regular check-ins and uh, and asking the employee for feedback and then also providing feedback as well. Um, making sure that they feel um, uh, welcome, the person feels welcomed from what, on, uh, from one day day one. The one of the things that I've introduced over the years to my clients is before somebody starts is to send them a, a sort of a, a pack about you know where to come what does it look like how to get there um you know where to go for lunch where to get good coffee and things like that so people and then a bit of an introduction to the team so people feel like they're already you know welcome to the team because i know for example myself when i don't like turning up to new places i get really sort of anxious about it and i have to do a lot of prep and a lot of detail prepping i have to go on google maps and go shit where do i need to go and you know who do i need to who do i need to speak to and where can i get a coffee where can i get lunch so that's the sort of thing that i would want to know so that's what you know i sort of encourage my clients to do um and i think those are you know so having those sort of things in place um adapting to yeah adapting to employees we kind of said it all really mm-hmm. um but those also help to make people feel safe as well um and and make sure that you've got a really good um you know, open communication platform, really good HR processes that, you know, allow for people to raise issues and concerns and, you know, have them listened to and um, and acted upon as well. Fantastic. No, so <laughs> my last question now, um, and it might be a little bit of a rehash of what we talked about, but let's see. So, Adena, you are aware, and, and, and even you, Natalie, because you said you work with small businesses as well, but Malta is filled with many micro to SME businesses, with the majority being family run. We see that many don't have HR and that the many that do have HR cannot administrate full HR practices. In both of these scenarios, what advice can you give the two of you that you can share and what steps can be taken now to foster a more neo-divergent inclusive environments? 
I, I think I had already mentioned this, but but obviously I'll I'll mention it again. Like um, obviously it's making the more awareness with with um, and encourage business owners to to train and be aware of 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 what's happening and educate themselves as well. Um, what is neurodiversity and and obviously the next step would be um, having the managers as well. So it's it's in a small business or medium business you'll you'll have the directors and then there's this level. So what happens with the directors? It it basically is the same with with the with the C level. So they still need the training. So for me, the the training is crucial. It's it needs to be there. They have to be aware. Uh, apart from from obviously the data, which which I have mentioned before, and something else that they can obviously as companies um, and small businesses they can reach out. To, for help from from third parties like like you Joseph like uh, it's it's I think it's only you doing uh, neurodiversity consultant with it's consulting see which is quite new um, to Malta so and I'm sure there are other um, third parties and that that we can tap into as as SMEs. Natalie, your closing thoughts? Oh, you about to say something? There's there's Lean Hospitality Foundation as well. Yes, who, yes. Who are very good in the in 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 the market. So. Yes. And I work very close to them as well. <laughs> uh, for me, I think um, everything that Adana said. Um, I mean, I suppose really it's about um, small business owners understanding the benefits of having neurodiverse people, understanding how they can use neurodiversities and any other disabilities um, to. Um, create a competitive advantage and then ultimately um, it's about us you know encouraging them to make use of people like myself um, who can provide them with a really good HR package and framework which will allow them to be you know work within the law and be inclusive be you know make sure that they are um, you know making provisions for diversity in the workplace and ticking all those boxes, as well as helping them create a really good culture, um, which ultimately is only going to benefit their bottom line, their productivity, and their their profitability. Which, at the end of the day, is probably what they're more important. They're more in, you know, more focused on. Um, but you know, if if as a business owner, if you want profitability, if you want productivity from from your employees, um, if you're not looking at your people. If you're not investing in your people in whatever ways, then you are not going to get that. So. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've answered all my questions and that was absolutely fantastic to both of you. So Adana and Ali, I want to thank you for being such great guests, bouncing off each other, and most of all, sharing your best practices for HR professionals on how to support neodivergent employees. Everyone, we have concluded day three of Neodiversity Week Malta, and we have two more amazing days with great speakers who are excited to share their insights on neodiversity in the workplace. Join me tomorrow at 12 p.m. as I'm joined by Dr. Erica Gallia as we speak about self-regulation and executive function. Till next time, take a leap and transform.